To discuss the recent events in America, I'm joined live from Vienna by Jarl Oselski, who's the Deputy Director of the Consumer Choice Centre. Jarl, thank you very much for joining me today here on A News. Thank you very much for having me. Now, you've uh, been following uh, closely, no doubt, the events in, in the US uh, from, from Austria. What's your view of this? This last few days has just been, in fact, this last week has, has been something quite unprecedented. What's, what's your reaction to how things are unfolding? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely crazy to see that, you know, we've had this huge sea change in the past couple of years about, you know, our government and elected officials. And a lot of people were predicting that we'd have some huge wave. But in fact, we didn't. Uh, definitely, it seems as if uh, Joe Biden squeaked out to become president. But in terms of the Senate, in terms of the House, uh, the Republicans actually only made progress, which means that the Biden agenda or the progressive agenda of those behind him may actually have a lot of difficulty getting passed because Republicans can also point to their own wins on election night. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, some key people who were uh, some key Republicans who were expected to be tossed off the ticket, were uh, followed through. So what does this, if the situation, particularly in the Senate, is uncertain at the moment, if the, uh, the scenario goes forward that the Senate remains a Republican majority, what does this mean for the U.S.? I think for many of us who are, you know, very dependent on many of the policies of the U.S. and something that we work in, it means that it's going to be a bulwark against the more progressive and some would say, uh, the more audacious proposals that many people have proposed from the Democratic Party. Uh, it means they are going to have to go to the negotiating table. And yes, it does mean that we're going to have a little bit of gridlock. Uh, that doesn't mean that nothing can get done. The pandemic is still huge on everyone's mind. We still need some kind of recovery package. We still need to talk about uh, some kind of liability shield for schools and businesses. There's so much that still needs to be discussed, and it's really important. It's not necessarily based on ideology. It's more about the need, especially considering the pandemic. And, and of course, one of the most concerning things that we've seen in recent times is the polarization that's, uh, that's occurred in the U.S., uh, at least as, as we've seen it from, from outside, and the, 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 strong, the strong rhetoric and almost threats of, um, of what might come if such and such happens. Joe Biden, uh, in, his, um, in his speech at the weekend, talked about healing the nation. Um, what, uh, what is going to be happening, do you think, in the coming months in the U.S.? Will, will the U.S. calm down? Will, will those who were firmly in support of Trump concede that, OK, maybe he, he didn't win this time. How will it play out? Well, ideally, everything stops getting politicized. You mm -hmm. know, I think uh, for many people, for my friends and my family, uh, everything has gotten politicized to such a huge degree. Everything becomes about politics. It doesn't matter if we're watching sports on Sunday or we're out at the afternoon pub with our friends. I would hopefully that is something that will subside. I think people will start to realize that you know putting everything that we have into politics and the idea of government and and everything that's about the ruling of people. Hopefully we can get away from that. We can get back to what makes our country great and its culture, its individuals, and it's a very rich civil society. And I think it's something that has always been very strong in our country. I think, unfortunately, the past few years, everyone kind of got into this really strange boxing match, and it became a reality show for many people. And uh, whether that was a good thing if you're on one side or a bad thing if you're on the other, I think if we're just moving forward and we can kind of get back to a healthy separation between politics and private civil lives, I think that's good. I think it's already starting right now. Unfortunately, the pandemic means we won't be able to meet as much, uh, much like I'm not able to leave Europe at the moment. Right. Not able to meet as much, but I do think we can get together and, and hopefully get past this. Now, you, you're obviously with the Consumer Choice Centre, Consumer Choice Centre, concerned about uh, everyday uh, people and, and how they're able to access uh, um, services and products. I, I, I understand. Um, so, th obviously, if this politicisation is is something that that it isn't good. But also behind that, 
there's an awful lot of lobbying and there's a lot of money behind the elections. And is, is this a healthy way for a democracy to conduct its business? Yeah, I think um, there's obviously election time and there's a lot of money that was spent. And believe me, this is a we saw the most amount of money being spent on elections ever. Uh, you did not have much criticism of this from Democrats, even though you normally would. I think it's because uh, they were trying to spend the money to get a guy out rather than bring someone in. But mm -hmm. I think it, you know it's something that always happens. There's there is always money involved. And one thing that we do very well in the U.S. is that we have a lot of private organizations that try to do things. You know, it's not all just run by the government. You do have a lot of competing interests. You know, in terms of the lobbying, I think a lot of people were just very confused throughout the Trump years. Who's really in charge? Who do we talk to? How can we try to get something done on our bill? There's a lot of confusion there. It seems as if things are going to go back to normal a bit. Uh, there's still going to be influence, and there is a lot of money. There's a lot of money from teachers' unions. There's a lot of money from industry. There's a lot of different people who are involved in this stuff. The only thing that we can do is really hope to push and champion our ideas. That's what we've been doing at Consumer Choice Center. That's what people are doing in, in many different organizations across the country. So you think uh, a Joe Biden administration would calm things down and uh, get things back to normal? Well, in a way, it's kind of a somewhat of a reset. Uh, I think people are just going to view the government as they always have. And ideally, we can look more towards our local institutions and our local governments, uh, especially with pandemics and COVID and everything that's been happening now. We've actually seen a lot of power being given to state governments, uh, the state power to quarantine, to enforce these lockdowns. And a lot of people have been affected by that. And I think when, once we know the paradigm is going to be a President Biden up top, once we know it's going to be some of the same characters from previous Democratic administrations, we know the rules of the game. And that means if we know the rules of the game, we know exactly how government is going to run. And ideally, individuals can understand their relationship to government as well. And I really do think it's a focus on these local governments, your state governments. I think that hopefully we have a lot more civic knowledge in our country now as to how things work. And I know many people have been debating the Electoral College, so we know how it works now. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that I think people are, are a bit more awake to. And, and that's, that, of course, for civil society is a good thing if people are clear where they stand because uncertainty breeds, breeds uncertainty. Can we expect, if, um, if and when Donald Trump does find, uh, finally uh, concede, if he has to, let, let's uh, leave that door open, um, the, the results, as uh, we've just been reminded, haven't been called until, the, I think, the 8th or 12th of December. But if and when Donald Trump does concede, do you think his um, supporters will, will accept that or will let there be a kickback uh, as has been mooted in, in recent weeks? Well, there's definitely going to be a lot of people who are sore. Uh, it's very difficult to lose an election specifically when, you know, there was all this pressure uh, that was pointing to Biden winning in a huge landslide. And in the end, it was just a squeaker. I think it's going to be very difficult for a lot of people to process. Most of the people in the Trump camp are generally skeptical of many of the main institutions, the media, government, uh, normal civil society. So it will be very difficult for a lot of people to accept what happened. Uh, however, there are plenty of avenues for these people to take up. And we saw that with the Tea Party uh, in 2010 and before that. We saw that with many progressive groups. There are, are different avenues that you can use to influence policy and government. It doesn't necessarily have to be through the presidency. Mm -hmm. In fact, many people might argue the presidency is, is actually one of the most difficult things to try to influence policy from. Because really, it's so much on local policy. It's so much on uh, bureaucracies. I think if people really want to try to influence, if they really want to make sure that they're heard, they can start their own civil society groups. They can join others that are doing the same things they believe in. There's plenty of choice. I think that's one of the great things about living in a republic is that you do have these other options that you can use to influence the society around you. And um, that's, that's a good thing, too. Now, um, as we said, uncertainty uh, is, is never a good thing. Europe has has certainly felt um, moments of dis, uh, discomfort over the last few years, and very sadly, just recently, uh, Vienna has been witness to uh, to a terror attack, which many might say is born of the political situation across Europe, with um, uh, with with a rise in popularism. Do you think that uh, if Biden does uh, uh, take the presidency, that this will help to stabilize things uh, across the world? 
Yeah, I think having uh, Trump as president for those four years meant that the, the Europeans were a bit lost. Again, they didn't know who to call. They didn't know who to influence. It was very difficult for them because they didn't have the normal prism of how a normal president would act and trade deals and such. I think a lot of people were probably very relieved. We saw very early congratulations from a lot of European leaders. Uh, but there's still a lot of ways that Americans are very divided against Europeans. Uh, there, you know, there's a lot of free trade proposals that uh, the U.S. has tried to put together. I know Trump had tried that with the United Kingdom. Uh, there hopefully will be talks to have a free trade deal between the European Union and the United States. But there are a lot of things like agricultural policy that the U.S. has been very insistent on the Europeans that they need to reform. They need to make sure that they embrace modern agriculture. You know, there's all kinds of things where actually the U.S. authorities are, have been very united. And I don't know if it's going to change much with a, a Biden and a Trump. Definitely through rhetoric, but the questions about NATO, the questions about where the U.S. is in the world, these are still very, very important. And uh, it might, you know, put a lot of Europeans at ease because now there is a democratic president. But U.S. interests are still pretty united. I don't know if there's going to be too much of a change. It really comes down to rhetoric and to relationships at the end of the day. Uh, absolutely. I mean, every country at the end of the day is fighting for its own best sovereign interests. So the. On the one hand, whilst the America First uh, slogan might seem very inclusive, it's how it's projected across the world. Can America First be America together with the rest of the world? Yeah, I think it's difficult. And I think, you know, the United States is a very unique country with a very unique political culture. I think that's why it's so difficult for people to understand exactly what's happening or to try to relate to any of the candidates or even some of the politics. You just don't have this in sort of a typical parliamentary democracies. It's a very different streak of culture, uh, very much based on individualism. But I think that's what makes it unique. How to unite that around the world? I mean, look, the entire world is already united by American culture. We all watch Hollywood movies. Uh, many of us use American slang or sayings. American companies are all around us. I think there's just a way that we have to, to try to get along in ways that make all of us freer, a little bit better off. Hopefully we can avoid war and we can trade together. I think that was probably one of the more difficult things with the Trump presidency is how trade was seen as, as something that hurts others and helps some. It actually helps everyone. And I, I think that's hopefully one thing that the Biden administration will address. It's how Europeans and, and people in other nations as well can also benefit from a growing American economic presence and all these other countries, too, once we get out from under this COVID mess, hopefully. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let's hope all the individuals, uh, all the individuals around the world, can listen to each other and come together in peace. Thank you very much, Yoel Lasowski, for joining me today here on A News. Thank you.